Revelation 14, the first 13 verses, because this passage is jam-packed. If you've had the chance to read through it already, you know what I'm getting at. Revelation 14, verse 1. Read along as I read out loud. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. And he heard, and I heard a voice from heaven like a roaring of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and received a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their tor torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for endurance for the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds followed them. Mm. Amen? You may be seated. Man, last night was a good night to be able to park in your garage, wasn't it? Because if you didn't, did you notice all the white stuff that you had on your windshield when you walked out? There's, a, there's an encouragement to clean things up. If you, if you have a garage and you can't park in it, you know, that's what those things were made for, right? To actually park in. Oh, come on. There's a lot of guilt in this room going, oh. <laughs> but all my stuff, what do I do with it? Garage sales, praise the Lord, spring's coming. <clears throat> hey, Revelation. What a book, amen? And yet it's a book that is not difficult to comprehend. Revelation, it, it's the only book in the scriptures. Do you remember this one? It's the only book in all the Bible that has a built-in blessing. What chapter, what verse? This, there's a hint. First chapter, third verse. Blessed is he. Oh, how full of joy is he who reads it and seeks to understand it and keep the things that are written in it. The only book that has that built-in blessing. What an incredible blessing God has given us. Affording us this book to... Just dig into it and be blessed by it. 
And it's, again, it's not difficult to understand because in it also we have the divine outline. Has anybody written that in or next to the verse that that refers to? The divine outline. Same chapter, different verse, almost at the end of chapter 1. It's verse 19, and it says what? It says that Jesus spoke to John, the author of, the, the writer of. I guess it's really Jesus is the author. John is the, the one taking the notes. But Jesus says to him right there, and he, and he gives the divine outline to the book of Revelation. He says to John, write what you have thing, the things that you have seen. Write what you've seen. Number one, anybody going to play along this morning? Come on. There's the first section of the outline. The things that you have seen. There's chapter one. There's the hint. That's the first section. Write what you have seen. Section two, he goes on to say, write the things that are presently. Chapter 2 and 3 are the letters to the churches. That's the second section or phase or portion of this book. And then the, the third portion, Jesus says to John in that same verse, and write the things which will take place. Metata you guys are getting ahead of me. Metatout is the last word in that verse. Write the things that will take place meta tauta after these things. There's the third bit of the outline, the divine outline that we're given to get comprehension, to understand this incredible book. And as we hear this morning dive into chapter 14, well, not only chapter 14, but chapter 15 as well, they are these two chapters that lay down various other details that are going on in the world scene and not just in the world or on planet Earth, but also in, in glory, in heaven. And, and, and it's details of things that are transpiring in the midst of the time of tribulation, in the midst of this, this window of time that brings together much of prophecy in the Old Testament and even much of that which is in the New Testament prophesied about the end times. And it's here in chapter 14, we get this other layer of detail. And these details are introduced here to really to bring a preparation for the final series of seven judgments. We've had two series already, right? And we will go into this third series, the judgments, the bold judgments in chapter 16. Now, as we delve into the details of these verses we've read this morning from chapter 14, as we, as we seek to, again, to lay them out before our mind and our heart, they're kind of like a, a movie trailer. Who's seen a movie trailer lately? They're, they're throwing them out there quite a bit because, you know, they want people to continue to watch movies, right? And, and we're in this chaotic time right now. But you know what movie trailers are like? Well, they're like a few things to me. Maybe, maybe for you, if you've watched a movie trailer, you've been intrigued. Anybody been intrigued by a movie trailer? Come on. You can be sure. Raise your hand. Only a few? Really? I've been intrigued by many movie trailers. But you know what? You, you find out with some movie trailers that you saw all the good parts. Once you go and see the movie, it's like, why did I spend money on this? They, they put it out you know, in the trailer. But you know what, what trailers, movie trailers specifically, are intended to do? They're intended to set a hook, <laughs> a hook of curiosity. Because what they present are insights of the big picture, right? Insights of, of what you will be seeing from stem to stern in the movie, from start to finish. And, and what, we, what we see here, what, what transpires before in the, in the details given in these next two chapters are like, well, they're like the layers of insight. We, we've brought that up a, a number of times through the, the chapters of Revelation and the study of the chapters. 
But what, what John has given is kind of layer upon layer upon layer of all these different aspects. I mean, I mean, we should be willing to kind of give God a break <laughs> and go, okay, because of all that is taking place in these seven years of tribulation, just give him some space to, to take time to develop his story. Amen? Because there is a, a gob of information that we get. And, and again, it's, it's similar to, Revelation is the study of it. It's similar to many other, specifically Old Testament books of prophecy, Ezekiel, Isaiah, those two. Daniel is another one that is, is similar to this. And that is, as you read through them, there is this plan of attack. There's this purposeful process that God delivers through them. And, and the process is this. The prophecies are proclaimed in those different books. And then what we notice many times is, okay, you get a prophecy, and then the prophet will pause by the leading of the Spirit of God. God will pause in a sense, and, and he'll reflect back on some of those things or reflect forward beyond those things and then, and then kind of bring them as another, again, layer of information to gain from. And, you know, with this process... We gain a perspective. We gain this insight that does look down the road of history, down the time frame that you're, you're in. But it doesn't only do that. It also takes the time to pause and look at the now, to, to understand the now. Uh, verse 1, it, it begins here, then I looked and John's been a busy guy, hasn't he? Looking and pondering and, and trying to keep up with all that is going on. Again, Jesus said, write, <laughs> take it down. Do you think he was doing this once in a while? Do you ever do this when you write? I actually don't because I'm, I'm left-handed, so I do this. <laughs> and, and really, it, it's more like this because I'm more on a typewriter, you know, the keyboard Typewriter. Wow, I just dated myself, didn't I? <laughs> wow. Well, Kim keeps calling me 60, which I'm not even close. If I count by days. But imagine John. You know, he, he looks and he's beholding yet another bit of the scene that's transpiring. And it says, on Mount Zion, Zion excuse me, stood the Lamb. I want to pause right there and, and just put out a, a real good one. How about this? Which one? Hmm. You mean there's more than one Mount Zion? Well, there's an actual place on earth called Mount Zion. Okay? It's on the, the hills, the sides of the north, if you know that, that old hymn. But it is where God has really set up camp for the, the proclamation of, of what he is all about and the messages that he has brought through the centuries. It is a real place. And it is a place that we, we will see, <laughs> we will see Jesus reign from. He will reign from the real earthly Mount Zion. And yet there is another place. In Hebrews 12, it talks about the, the city of our God, the heavenly <laughs> Mount Zion. And so people have, have, you know, kind of put out the argument or their stance on what Mount Zion this is. Some would say because Jesus is depicted as the lamb here, that this must be the heavenly Mount Zion. Because he's seen as the lamb in glory. And yet on his return, they would say, when he shows back up on planet earth, what does he come as? No longer the lamb, but the 
lion of the tribe of Judah. And he sets up what we call the thousand-year reign, the millennial reign of Christ. And so that would be their argument that, look, he's the lamb, therefore it must be the heavenly Mount Zion. I tend to look at this as a, again, foreshadowing, looking into the annals of time or looking down through the the rest of this prophetic time. Again, looking at not just here and now, but the the future and, and see this as a foreshadowing of Jesus' return to Mount Zion, okay? It's this spiritual picture of that event and it shows the, the victory as well of those 144,000 that Jesus has sealed all the way back in chapter 7 of Revelation. Do you remember that? Specifically, they were, in a sense, called out of the tribes, every tribe of the nation of Israel. Now, again, we, we can't get dogmatic about this. I don't think we need to. It's not a salvistic. Ooh, there's a big term, right? It's not, it's not a salvation issue. Okay, but it's an interesting one to, to note. And, and I just make this point. If this is a heavenly scene and therefore a, a heavenly Mount Zion, then that seal, that what seems to us in chapter 7 when they are sealed, it, it's this protective covering that, that God puts on them at that point. We would have to agree that Well, that seal has an expiration date because it would mean if they're in heaven that they likely got there through martyrdom, right? They went from doing their business, serving the Lord here while they're sealed and yet the the expiration comes and now they're in glory. And so, again, not to be dogmatic, but... I don't know that there's any reason to say that that seal of protection ended, but rather that these are more like Daniel's boys. You remember Daniel's boys? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? I'm sure those aren't pronounced exactly properly, but you remember the three Hebrew boys? It's interesting. It's specifically pointed out that they are, you know, of the nation of Israel. Do you remember what they stood up against? It's really curious. They stood up against a big statue that was made to worship the God of that kingdom. And yet, what did they say? As they came up to it and they saw it, no doubt they were afar off because we understand that even the the guards that took them into it got singed. So they were standing off at a distance with this mighty man of power. And they said, you know, our God can save us from the fires. But I love what they go on to say. Do you remember? Even if he doesn't, we ain't going to worship you. Isn't that a cool perspective? That even though I may die in the flames, I'm not going to reject my God, be unfaithful to my God. And of course, what happened to them? They went in and the the guy's like, wait a minute. I sent three, but I see four. One is like the son of man. He's in there with him. What's, What's going on? And then it says they came out and they didn't even smell of smoke. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? I'm, I'm thinking they're coming out going, yeah. What else do you want to try on us? I would say that these 144,000 are more like them. That is, that they were sent into a trial, the trial by an evil man. The trials that will go on just like those in these days of Revelation for the 144,000 that were cared for by God. And though they go into their own trial, just like the Hebrew boys that went into it, God will protect them, not just till a certain point, but all the way through and bring them through it ultimately. And and here it is. It's to stand with the Lord. Hmm. I love that loving encouragement. 
that incredible encouragement. It says, as that verse goes on, and with him 144,000. You know why I say that number again and again, and now I think it's the fifth time? Because it's not 139,999. God didn't miss one. He, he, he didn't forget one. He didn't just lose one of them. No, all of them are here standing. All of them have made it through their trials. This difficult time of standing and, and living by faith and, and pressing in to do their business for the kingdom of God. And folks, as, as I, I, I put that out, I hope you understand that that is an encouragement for you as well. For you and I in this world, in the trials that we face. But it says that this 144,000 had the name, specifically it says his name, that is the name of Jesus and his father, God the Father, written on their foreheads. You know, I like to point out in the study of Revelation, we understand that God is... He's a tattoo artist. Do you know that? He's, he's putting these tattoos, these marks, on many. He, he has a, a few of them himself. We'll, we'll hear of one on his thigh. He, so he's not, a, you know, he's not against tattoos. I, I, I guess I say that for those of you that might have come in like this. Or, or maybe, you know, worn long sleeves so they couldn't be seen. And I understand that. I, I get it. I have long sleeves on, but I am the only pure one in our family. <laughs> what I mean by that is I'm the only one in our family. Of the adults, of course, the grandkids haven't been tainted. But I'm the only one that doesn't have a tattoo. Even my bride has a tattoo. She'll, she'll show it to you. It's on the outside of her foot. It's really cute. It actually is. But here, they have the mark. They have the name marked on them, written on their foreheads. I know some of you ladies are going, couldn't he have put it somewhere else? <laughs> I bet you you're, some of you are thinking that. That'll, that'll just get in the way. <laughs> but, you know, thinking about that, we, we've, we've already seen that the devil has his mark, right? We just studied that last week. The devil has his mark, and, and, and it's curious because we, we've talked about this false identity that the devil has continued to put out there, the anti-Christ, the anti-God, the anti-spirit, right? So he's put this false Godhead out here, and, and he's marked his with a mark. And, and now we see the, the spiritual, the pure parallel, and that's the mark of God. What ID, what mark is more advantageous, do you think? That of the devil? The number of man? Or, or that of Jesus and the Father? It's a no-brainer, right? It's that of the Father. Now, we, we read this morning, we're going to get into the details of, of what it is to take the, the mark of the beast. But you know, I, I thought about this too. If you're a Christian... You and I are going to spend some time together down the road, aren't we? It's called eternity. Yeah, so get used to me. I, I don't think I'll have one of these in heaven. And maybe some of you, is the, wow, good. <laughs> but you know, we're going to spend some time together. We're going to spend eternity. But you know what we will not have in eternity? We won't have but the name of Jesus on us. We won't have like a big B if we're Baptists or a big A if we're Assembly of God. There won't be a dove in glory. Do you like the dove? The dove is kind of cool. You know, we had a different dove when we first started and Kim was like, we got to get rid of that dove because it looked like it was, you know, piercing. It was on fire and coming, you know, like it was going to blow up if it landed. So we went back to the traditional Calvary dove, and um, it's kind of cool. But again, in glory, 
in eternity when we're together. It's not like we're going to come up and say, look at my sign. Has anybody asked you what sign you are lately? Isn't that funny? You know, people won't believe in God, but they'll believe in astronomical stuff. You know, what's your sign? Isn't Virgo supposed to be like a real cool one? To, sounds cool. I'm Virgo. But in eternity, there will be no labels, folks. No labels. It's a good thing to be mindful of. Verse 2, and it says, John heard a great voice from heaven, a voice, a thunderous voice. See how it's described? It, it's like the roar of many waters. It's like the sound of loud thunder. Now, if we're, we're connecting the dots here, this is none other than the voice of God or the voice of Jesus. We, we see it described, the voice described just like this in the, the opening passage of Revelation. And John turned around to this voice that he heard, and, and that's what he wrote in chapter 1, what he saw, just like he was instructed by Jesus to write. But that was the voice also of, of many waters and that sounded like thunder. Hmm. And I heard, it says, what was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. You know, I, I just take that in and say, man, here's God, the, the orchestrator. He's the orchestrator, right? Or, or we would say the, the conductor or director of the choir and the orchestra. Here is God's voice, in a sense, rallying all of the musicians, getting them to come together. And, and they're, what's the term when you, you have a violin? It's rosing up your bow. Ros, how do you say that word? Yeah, I can't say it. Whatever that term is, you, you get it ready to play. And here is the voice of God saying, okay, bring it together here. We are about to. To rip. And they, verse 3. Now, I don't believe this has to do with those playing the instruments. This they is the 144,000. As we, we see, you know, plainly put before us. But they were singing a new song. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So in verse 1, we see that this number, this unique number, 144,000 specifically, they have their feet firmly planted on Mount Zion. And yet here, as their praises begin to rise, they go right into the presence of God, right into the throne room. You know, that was our prayer this morning, when, when the worship team, before service starts, set, a, set aside just a few moments to sit before the Lord, our prayer that, that went out was that we would all understand what we're doing today and, and what, what privileged place God has given us. He's opened up the throne room of heaven. And you know, as we begin to sing our praises, as we Start in song. We should understand that. That we literally, in the spiritual sense, we are lifted up. <laughs> we are entered into the very presence of God. In, in a unique way. And, and, you know, some of you guys are going, aren't we already in the presence of God? Yes. Yes. But praise are, are songs of adoration and thanksgiving. They are unique in the sense that we can transport ourselves and be heard in the heavenly places. That, folks, is something that should cause you to go, wow. We should be in awe of that element that we have gained because of Jesus. So 
Spurgeon wrote this. To be wrapped in praise to God, and, and the word is R-A-P-T. It's an interesting term. It means to be enveloped by, kind of like to be wrapped up. But to be wrapped in praise to God is the highest state of the soul. To receive the mercy for which we praise God for is something. But, he went on to say, but to be wholly clothed with praise to God for the mercy received is far more. When we bow in adoration, <laughs> we are at our very highest. Whew. And folks, I've plugged this before through the years, and I'm going to dare to do it again. If you're not here anticipating that, you're missing out. And if you didn't quite understand what I just said, I'll say it a little more plainly. Service starts at 9 o'clock. Through the years, people have come and said, hey, why don't we just wait five minutes? Give people five minutes. Like, then I would be a bad teacher. And I would be teaching people to just go, hey, it's whatever time I get there. If you're late, I always tell leaders, if you're on time, you're late. A leader should be early. Prompt is the idea. Be there before. But you know, if you're just coming to engage in what the Lord has for study, know that there's this, this preparation time. And it is the time that we give adoration, we give thanks, we acknowledge who it is that we go before. And we do that primarily in song, in worship songs. And so if you, for whatever reason, and here again, it's, it's I've gone kind of up here, now I've gone down here, I'll, I'll just get real basic. If you lollygag on Sunday morning and you're not here when we start, you're missing out. You're missing out. What do we call this day? Who, what? The whose day? The Lord's day. You know when today started? Yeah, if you get real technical, it started at 12.01, right? I'll give you a break. Today started at 6 a.m. How much of this day, the day of the Lord, are you going to give to him? Come before the Lord, anticipating what he's going to do. How he's going to work in, in your midst. Don't drag your spouse along going, oh, Lord, work, work. Oh, he will. But come with the anticipation of, of what he's going to speak to your heart. And into your life. If you haven't had that. If I haven't rubbed you the wrong way like that before or in a while. You can thank me after service. The verse goes on and it says, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Now, this makes it very clear who this crew is. And they are a unique group. They're set aside. They're, they're different than you and I as the church. And it's not that they got saved. It's not that they came to face some different way. Don't understand me or don't misunderstand me in that way. Please do understand me. And yet they have this unique place and position and role to play in the things of God. But you know, having endured the seven years of tribulation, I can only imagine the lyrics to this song. Aren't, aren't worship songs so cool? 
I know sometimes it's, it's hard to, you know, without them, without the lyrics being put up, it, you know, it's hard at, at first to know what they're saying sometimes. But who's got a handful of, of worship songs? I, I was listening to um, Spotify in my office, and it was just a mix of all sorts of, you know, artists and, and whatnot. And there was a couple that came on, and I was like, oh, stop studying. I'm turning the volume up. That's me turning the volume up, by the way. And I was just enraptured by the song. By the lyrics of it. <clears throat> but I wonder, have you ever come into a song or heard a song and, and it's really difficult to get the beat? There, there are still, for me, and I'm what I would say, a, you know, a whatever kind of percussionist. I, I like playing my, my dashboard and my steering wheel a lot. But through the years, you know, I've, I've really acquired the ability to, you know, kind of stay with the beat most of the time. But there are still today a few songs that I will, I will hear that are, you know, maybe decades old. And I'm like, how did they do that? And they change up the beat, you know. This, I think, is, is one of those songs that what we should do, and maybe, maybe even in here at times, we should just sit back and enjoy just enjoy what God is putting before us and enjoy hearing what those, again, those who have come through this unique time of trial are praising God about. As we go on in this passage, John gives detail to the character of this unique group of 144,000. Notice a few things. In verse 4 it says, These are not defiled, or they have not defiled themselves with women, for they're virgins. You know that some commentators have a, a hard time with this term, and, and therefore they, they strictly symbolize, or they make it symbolic of this group's Purity, and just saying it's, it's a spiritual purity, not a physical purity necessarily. And, and they do that because this, this word virgin or virgins is primarily used to speak of young girls that have not become married and therefore have not given their virginity to their husband. And yet, if you look at that term, it's, it's one that also applies to guys, can apply to males, and as we look at that, it's, it's a pretty profound time, or, or I should say a profound characteristic to take on during this time, to be chaste. I love that, that term. They have not defiled themselves with women. It, it speaks of a chasteness. And I don't believe it has to be just this in this spiritual sense. I believe that just like Paul, remember Paul in his letter, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, might be 2 Corinthians, and he talks about tough times in ministry. And he says, you know, I, I wish you were like me. And that is, he was unmarried. He was chaste in his physical relationship with, with women. He did not have a wife. Although at some point we understand he must have because he was part of the Sanhedrin. But he was saying that I wish you were like me and that you could be chaste. You could be putting that relationship, that sexual relationship aside and focus on the things of God. And there's, there's a benefit to that. And, and he was couching it in this idea that, you know, the world out there is, is a wicked place and it, and it needs Jesus. It needs the gospel to go out. And, and there's less of a burden to bring with you as you serve when you're not married. Because he says, when you're married, and he wasn't against marriage by any means. But he says, when you're married, you have that extra challenge as you go and serve. It's just the way things are. But I believe this does speak of a physical purity, virginity, if you will. It, it goes on and it says that, that these they follow the Lord or the Lamb wherever he goes. That hmm. seems to be, a, a, again, this foreshadowing of, of what they're going to be a part of. 
in, in eternity, or at least in the millennial age. But these have, he goes on, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits to God and the Lamb. There's an interesting term, first fruits. You know, it, Jesus is described as the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning that he was truly the first one to be resurrected. There, there have been people that have been brought back to the brought back to life from the dead, okay? But Jesus was the one, the first one that was resurrected, given a new body in his new life as he came back from the grave. <clears throat> and these seem to be the first fruits of the impact of what God is doing through them. I, I've described them as you know, 144,000 young Jewish Billy Grahams that go out into this sin-sick world proclaiming the gospel. And so through that ministry, many come to faith in Jesus during this time. But they are the first fruits. Notice it goes on in verse 5, that in their mouth no lie was found, for they were blameless. You know, these somewhat curious characteristics, when we understand them, when, when we come into the midst of the meaning of them, they can cause us to, and they should cause us, to reflect on where we are, where our character is. How are we doing in our purity? How are we doing how about that, that one right there in verse 5? In their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. I'm like, I'm out. Anybody else? Whew. Yeah, I, I believe that these characteristics, they, they do speak in a general sense, but they get very specific on the characteristics of a believer. And I ask again, in the midst of those, or maybe if we put them all together, it's, it's this high bar of spiritual character. Where do we find ourselves? And I will say this, wherever we are in that process, in that development. Praise God, number one, he can change us, amen? He can continue, he desires. His plan is to continue to transform us, to renew our mind, right? And to strengthen us, to be more like Jesus. But I will also back that up with this. That whatever character we have, the characteristics that we have, whatever those are, they determine the force of our testimony to this world. And if the world looks on and finds a crack in our testimony, you know what they're going to do? <laughs> Ain't going to listen to you. I'm not going down that path. I've heard how you join in the dirty jokes. I remember early on as, as a very young believer, Kim and I weren't even married at the time. I got my first duty station with the Coast Guard up in Alaska, and I worked for a mechanic on the base. Mechanic, you know, slash, I could say, place oil field worker in there, Okay. And kind of funny because, you know, in the Coast Guard, you're, you're kind of seen as a sailor, right? Some would make fun. It's just shallow water, although we've got, there's ships in the Coast Guard that go in the deep waters too. But m my point being this, sailors are known for what? Well, I didn't join the Coast Guard until I was like 21. And what's fascinating is I, I was like prepped for the role. You know how? My dad, 
people would say, oh, man, he can cuss like a sailor. And, and he trained his offspring to do just the same. And so I went into that arena as a young believer with, with those trappings, that background, that influence. And now I'm set in the midst of a mechanic shop and they're blowing and going with dirty jokes and, and all sorts of cussing and swearing and, you know. And the Lord was like, okay, where are you going to be in here? Are you going to walk with me? Are you going to be transformed? Or, or is that just an area of your life you're, you're going to say, well, you know, I, I, I got to do this because I'm, I'm here. Folks, the, the depth of our character, the purity of our character, it does and it will determine the impact that we have on the lives that we live around. And the people that we hoped to impact for Jesus with the gospel. To God's glory. Man, I remember my first, the first Bible that I, I really read. I actually got it from basic training. It was a Bible that was about this big. And there, therefore, it was pretty thick. And I remember having that in, in whatever jacket I was wearing. And I would take a bathroom break, you know. And go off and just go, oh, God. And I was re reading Psalms and Proverbs like they were hotcakes. And just diving in going, I need to be reinforced spiritually, God. And to the glory of God, a couple of those guys that we worked with, that I worked with, that Kim and I interacted with as a young couple. Because I was still working there when she came in to my life as my bride. But some of those... A couple of those guys I remember we had interaction with. We had times of fellowship, if you will, and they would ask about God. They would ask about this relationship that they didn't have. And I, Ernie Busby, he was a first class petty officer that worked in that shop. And he and I, I was just a, you know, a, a seaman, as you call, when you just enter. The Coast Guard, you're just a seaman. You're, you're basically a, a non-rate. You don't have any specifics that you've been trained with or trained in. And yet this first class bosun's mate, he, he came to me on a number of occasions because we, again, worked side by side. And we had some really cool conversations about the Lord. Come to find out he was raised in the church but had kind of just balked at it when he got older and all of that to say that as we allow the Lord to be our strength and, and to give us not what the what character we have or what we've been given by this world or by our upbringing but look to him and allow him to to transform us to bring purity to to come to a place we have no lie on our mouth on our, our lips it's with that that God will forcefully, that is powerfully and purposefully, use our testimonies. With, with verse 6 now as we go on, we see this, this shift. And he goes into these, these visions, if you will, or these, these pictures of what, these really they're videos of what's going on. In verse 6, it says, he saw another angel. Now, again, as we've talked about John in the midst of this book, he has been very busy, and he has been engaging very many different aspects or beings in heaven and on earth. And here is yet, as he says, another angel. And this angel was flying directly overhead. We've talked about this through the study as well, that it's good to have perspective when you're trying to calculate what is going on in the book of Revelation. So here is John on the earth because he's looking up and he's seeing that a direct, directly overhead is this angel speaking out. And it says that it shared an eternal gospel proclaiming to those who dwell on the earth. And this is what he speaks of. It's every nation, tribe, language, and people. 
What's really fascinating about the things that are called angels in the book of Revelation is there have been companies, Christian companies, that have um, started different um, telecommunication ministries, you know, that you can get your, your, you know, television from a certain satellite that they're tied to. And you know what they've called it? They've called it the angel, the satellite that they, they have this coming through. It's, it's the angel claiming that this is the angel that's declaring from the heavens the message of God, this eternal gospel. And not only presently, but you can go back through. Oh, I'm, I'm spacing on the, the, the theologian. But there was a guy that, that wrote. It was during the, the, the Reformation period. And this guy wrote prolifically. That means he, he wrote a bunch of pages, a bunch of articles that were pushing back on the Catholic Church. And specifically the Pope. And another guy looked at him as the angel because he had been so profound in presenting the gospel he said he must be this angel because back then they believed that the pope was the antichrist they really did and for some reasons we can understand why at times that was you know their thinking as the pope was like let's go out and and kill people because they want to read the bible you know i could imagine going wow you're pretty anti-god you know but it's fascinating that, that here is an angel going out. And it's, it's proclaiming this gospel to the, to the world. Isn't it incredible to see that even here, even here at this time, the times, the days of tribulation, the, we could say the last hours of humanity, when humanity has been so <laughs> themselves anti-God, isn't it phenomenal to see that God is still, though with a different tool or instrument, God is still willing to proclaim grace and mercy to mankind? It may be unconventional in our thinking. An angel sharing the gospel? I thought that was man's responsibility. Yeah, and primarily it is. And yet, isn't it fascinating to find out these days that God is speaking to some non-believers through visions? Many times it's, it's a vision of Jesus. It's a dream about Jesus. And he is declaring to them that they need to come to faith in him. So we understand that there, there are different moments throughout history that God has kind of pressed in with a unique tool to share the gospel. He says with a, a loud voice, verse 7, fear God and give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him who is the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. You know, there are those that are kind of pessimistic at character by, by nature, if you will. Ungracious sometimes in their heart. And, and some of those will say, this is not really an offer of salvation, you know. And I would say, well, you got to take that up because it says it's the gospel. It's the eternal good news. And that the angel does go out and share it with whoever is left in the nations and the people of the earth at this time. But then verse 8, it goes into yet another angel, a second followed. And his statement is, is pretty brief. It's, it's just this one verse. But it says specifically, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She, it's interesting, it's a, this designator is, is feminine. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, on the one hand, you hear that and you're like, wow, who is this? And we'll get to that. But I want to say how reassuring this is. All the more reassuring that God is overseeing this, this thing. The angel is sent out 
to proclaim, hey, Babylon, yeah, Babylon, the great, she's fallen. No, really, fallen. It's done with. It's dealt with. She who made the nations, look at that detail again. She made the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now, there are those, again, who, who try to step in and say, oh, this is just, you know, symbolic in nature. But you think of, think of some of the religious cults that have come and gone through the centuries, many long before we were a nation. But think of some of those religious cults. What did they often include? Had a chance to be in the ruins of Ephesus years back. And they were putting stuff together, you know, kind of taking all the, the remnants and the ruins and trying to build back at least a portion of what had been the ancient city of Ephesus. And, you know, under a pile of rubble, they, sat, they found one of the, the, the grossest statues I've ever seen. And it was a statue of one of their gods. Athenia, I believe, was her name. And, and she was a god that they would go to and worship at their temple. You know what this goddess looked like? Her, her, her face and her head was, you know, normal size and everything. And she, was, she had nice features, pretty lady, you might say. And yet, starting here and going all the way down to here, she was covered with, excuse the term, but naked breasts. Not, not just like a, you know, a usual gal who's equipped with, you know, what she's equipped with by God. But she's covered. This statue is covered with breasts. Because it was the God of fertility. The God of life. And, and the worshipers of her would go and, if you know any of the history, it was, it was gross. It was sick. It, it's what we would call the, the red light district. But to worship the gods in those temples, you would go down and, and girls, young women have been incorporated many times in, in the, the realm of slavery. They were put there to be prostitutes for those temples. And my point in all of that is, do you see how corrupt the religious systems of men can get? They thought that was right on how to be blessed by your God or goddess. How perverted is the mind of men when they make up religious systems? And, and so we, when we hear of Babylon and the wine of her passion of sexual immorality, certainly it had this religious element to it, but it's very likely that there was also this perversion, this sexual perversion that was in and through it all. Now, we're going to get to Babylon in chapter 17 specifically. So, by and large, we'll just hold off until we get there. But, you know, Babylon was a real place. And, in fact, Saddam Hussein poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the ruins of it. Before, you know, the, the wars that we were in some years back. What's unfortunate is that through those wars and, and even more recent wars, some of the artifacts, some of those, those things that would take you back beyond what we, we understand is, you know, the modern uh, population or modern civilization, they were ruined. They were obliterated by bombs. But is this that place? Is it, is it speaking of the literal Babylon? You know, some commentators, when, when Revelation speaks of, of Babylon, they claim that it's us, that is the U.S. And I think as you go through the, the details of, and we'll study again in chapter seven, 17 more so, the details of her characteristics, it's not too far off. We could say, wow, we, we as a nation line up with what we're promoting and what we're, we're putting out there. But throughout Scripture, Babylon is, is seen 
as one of three things. It's seen as a literal place, or it's seen as a political power, or it's understood to be the religious influence of a time frame in the scriptures, an era. But suffice it to say that this angel is coming on the scene saying, hey, do not trust in this world and the world system. Babylon. Babylon's fallen. <laughs> Babylon is going down, the angel is declaring. Don't put your trust, don't put your hope, don't, certainly don't put your faith in Babylon. And then verse 9, another angel. A third angel. Notice it says, follow them. Now, it's most likely, though I, I didn't quite find it completely understandable when it says follow them, it if it was referring to the first two angels that the third angel is following, or is if this is saying it followed them, meaning it followed the people in the, the world that are left. It, either way, this third angel says, again with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. Guys, if you were at men's prayer just a few weeks ago, we read Psalm 75. And in that psalm, we talked about this cup the dregs of this cup. And it was a tie-in to the judgments of God. And it, it being fully mixed, meaning the judgment of God is, is going to be completely poured out on the sin-sick, Christ-rejecting world. And it's quite the combination that, that we are given here. It says the one who takes the mark, who worships the beast, he will drink this wine. And it's the wine of God's wrath that is poured out in the cup of his anger. There, there's the combination I want to bring up. Wrath and anger. The Greek word wrath is thymos. And it speaks of passionate anger. Has anybody had, I, I won't even have you raise your hand. But has anybody in here been passionately angry? I mean, like, your anger is coming from the bowels of your being. Your emotions are completely tied into the anger that you are expressing or feeling. Anybody? Yeah, probably. If we were honest, we'd probably, many of us, at least raise our hand. And, and that's spoken of God. It, it's a passionate Anger. You know, it's really curious. That word in the Greek is only used 11 different times in the New Testament. Ten of those times is here in Revelation. Whew. God's passionate about bringing, not, not judgment, but righteousness. Yes, there's judgment in it. Now, the other, the other word here for anger or indignation, maybe in your translation, is or gay. And it's really the opposite spectrum of anger where the first is a passionate one. This or gay is a settled disposition. It's kind of like, if you will, and I won't have you confess this either, but if you've been in a courtroom and you've had a judge go bang with the gavel, he usually does it, you know, on this pretty calm setting, right? I don't, I don't know that there's ever been a judge in, in my recollection, and not that I was, you know, on the other side of that gavel, but that a, that a judge has gotten up and beaten it, you know, and just been impassioned with his judgment. But rather, it's just this, this settled disposition. Hey, you're guilty. You will pay the fee. You will, you know, do the time. And, and yet here, they're combined. They're both understood. It goes on in, in that verse to say, he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the angels as well as in the presence of the lamb. Folks, this is rebellion's outcome. 
This is rebellion's outcome. I would say that this here as well is a foreshadowing of the final judgment on a sin-sick, Christ-rejecting world. And yet specifically, it is on those who have worshipped and received the kingdom of the devil. You know, in the first century, when the Caesars were really having a heyday, they, they got themselves to a point that they believed themselves to be gods. And what you would do to express that, if you've read the history, they would have everybody who was a citizen of their empire, one time of year, they would all have to do this. And it might be specifically before him on his throne or, you know, disconnected. If you couldn't get there, you would do it under his authority in other cities with usually a statue of him before you as well. But you, what you would literally do is take a pinch of incense that's in this big bowl and bring it over to the fire and drop it in. And then you would declare, you know what you would declare? Caesar is Lord. And it was by some considered to be nothing more than, well, what you do as a citizen. It was just a part of civic duty. It was an innocent act they would proclaim. Now, those, those that were proclaiming this were unsaved, unregenerated, certainly undiscerning of what they were promoting. And it wasn't done by those who were saved, those who knew the Lord. Because they understand, they understood what they were doing. They were worshiping a false god. And they wouldn't do that. And unfortunately for them, although really not so, because though they were snuffed out, you were killed if you would not do that. Well, there's an early arrival, I guess, right? Into the presence of God. And, you know, some demand even that God wouldn't do such an unloving thing to his creation. He wouldn't bring such a harsh, harsh judgment. Folks, hear me on this. That mindset, the, the mindset of demanding anything from the Lord to begin with. But the mindset of, of demanding God to do it a certain way. And, and not judge, not bring, you know, a clarification of the guilt, really, is what, what's going on there in judgment. But that mindset, it misses a couple of things about the loving God of the Bible. Two things primarily, if you're taking notes, it misses God's holiness, and it miss, misses his righteousness. A loving God would not be righteous if he did not judge sin. A loving God, the God of the Bible that we love and serve, he would not be <laughs> righteous. He would not be <laughs> holy if he didn't judge sin. And, and please know this. There will not be any casual or mistaken allegiances to the beast. It's not going to be like people turn around and go, what did, I, what did I just get on my hand? What did he just put on my forehead? What have I just called out to give allegiance to? No one's going to be taken by this or, or surprised by it. We must remember that hell was not intended for mankind. Do you, under, do you understand that? Hell was not intended for mankind. When God created Adam and Eve, he wasn't going, oh, great, some of these guys are going to hell. No. It was not created but for the fallen angels and Lucifer at their head. Mankind, each 
person throughout history will freely choose. They will choose to reject. They will choose sin. They will choose rebellion. They'll choose darkness. They will choose hell. It will be their decision. And God, righteous, holy God, God will be the judge. And you think of a judge in a courtroom. He listens, and he gets things clarified from both sides, and he says, okay, this is it. Usually has 12 people helping him in that process. But he's not saying, I want you guilty. He's just going, I'm declaring your guilt because of the evidence against you. It is clear you're guilty. We close down to a powerful couple of verses here. It says the smoke of their tor- torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. These are the worshipers of the beast and its image who receives the mark of its name. This is where that term, no rest for the wicked, it will be fully comprehended by those who refuse Jesus. Please note, Please note this, because there's, there's been a trend not too long ago in the church to say that hell is not really real. Please note from our passage that hell and hell's punishment, hell's suffering is real. And it is eternal. No rest, day and night. It's not just like a, a time out from God. It's not this, well, hey, you just go aside and, and you know, you're dealt with and then poof, you're done. No, as our eternal security and blessing will be with God, the eternal punishment and rejection and disconnect from God will be eternal for those who do just that. Reject God. Verse 12, John's pastor's heart seems to be interjected here. Here's a call for endurance. There's that hoopamone term again. We've seen it a number of times, that staying power. Here's the, the hoopamone for the hoopamone of the saints, the endurance, the patience of those that are believers, those who Keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And certainly this was for those who will be living out these days by faith. But it also, I believe, it is also surely for us in these days. To be faithful. To allow the Lord to press you into his mold all the more. Though it is usually because of us, not because of God, but it is because of us that we are going through a trial and God says, yep, 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 I got you. I'm going I'm to squeeze you into this. And as I do, I'm going to squeeze all the world out of you, all of your flesh. Oh, that we would endure. <laughs> I love the end. The voice from heaven. Write this. I wonder if John at this point had, Dropped his pen. (laughs) Hey, pick it up. Write this. Voice from heaven. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Hmm. Isn't that cool? They're acknowledged. (laughs) They're encouraged. Though they will die as martyrs, they will die in the Lord. The Spirit chimes in here. Blessed indeed. Blessed indeed. Oh, how happy indeed that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Hmm. Here's a compound effect of the Godhead. God the Father and God the Spirit. Blessed are they. Oh, how joyful. You know, folks, this passage reminds us that character does count. And it counts in this life. And it counts in our pursuit to be witnesses to those around us, 
to the lost, to the last, to the least. Let's pray. Let's pray that we would, as Jesus said, we are called to abide in him. Amen. Let's pray that we would do that all the more. Abide in him. And let's pray this as well. Jesus also said, occupy until I come. You know what that doesn't mean? It doesn't mean you do part of the Lord's day and then you walk out and go, okay, I'm going to go have some me time. No, it says that you're, you and I need to be ready and willing to be God's tools, witnesses all day. And not just today, but every day that he gives us. Amen. So, Father, we thank you, God, that you have, God, given us everything we need. And we set, Lord, our lives before you. And, Lord, we pray that we, God, would humbly come before you, amazed, Lord, at the grace that you have poured out, the the mercies that you have shown to us. To rescue us. God, rescue us of of an eternity. And apart from you and and filled with anguish. And God, you've, you've set us on the path into eternity with you. God, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, by your spirit, well up. Manifest yourself, dear God. Lord, that our hearts would would seek to truly abide in you. Lord, it's awesome to hear that you say, if we will abide in you, that we will have fruit that remains. Doesn't fall off the branches in the storm, but it remains. And certainly there's a purpose, Lord. It's that we would occupy, Lord, that we would take up the banner, Lord, that you have placed before us, and we would go into the highways and the byways, Lord, and we would be witnesses, Lord, with character that is being developed even this very moment, that higher bar of your character in us. For your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship as we close.